I'm Arsenecki. I am 25 years old. I had to think about that for a second. My pronouns are they, them, and she, her. And I am a working artist who specializes in drag, but also works in a bunch of other related mediums. What's funny about a lot of drag, and I feel like especially old school drag in general is about like putting on a character with a fully developed backstory like how they came about um like this whole fictional past life i think is pretty key to some people's drag characters or drag personas that's not how arson um is to me arson is actually just an extension of my day-to-day -day self arson is the permission that I give to myself to uh, say whatever I want and do whatever I want because I find that when you put on a wig and lashes but only on the bottom half of your eyes and um, all this makeup and a dress that is um, way too much and is in very poor taste and you lip sync to other people's music, uh, suddenly people take you a lot more seriously for some reason than if you were just wearing, you know, clothes like these and walking down the street and saying the exact same thing. So in a way, arson is almost like a, like a, like a horn to project uh, what it is that I truly feel and is not in any way this sort of put on character. Everything that I say in face is exactly how I myself in my day to day life feel and think. I've been doing theater for 10, 11, 12 ish years give or take. Um, that's mostly what I was doing in my spare time in high school. Um, I have a degree in theater from the University of Washington. Um, so performance in all of its forms, uh, most specifically acting and uh, directing and a little bit of stage tech have all been sort of part of my life. But uh, drag has really only been part of my life for the last two and a half years, drag specifically, but it's kind of all drag if you if you really want to get technical about it. <laughs> Performance has been part of my whole life. Um, it's just kind of nice to be <laughs> uh, to be incorporating um, my queerness into what I'm doing because that's actually kind of a new thing for me. That's not it's not how I've functioned um, for most of my life in my artistic work. So that's kind of a perk <laughs> for pretty much 80% of the day, um, people refer to me as arson. Um, but since arson has only existed in that sort of named form for two and a half years, it's really funny, like interacting with people who knew me in college and high school, because they'll come to the shows and they'll want to support and they'll come up to me and rightly so be like, I'm a little bit confused as to how to refer to you or what to call you. And to be honest, it sort of changes um, between contexts and in um, different moments and in different places so it's kind of awesome to be able to expose friends from that life um, to my life now because it almost allows them to uh, to learn a little bit about, you know, my identity as, you know, a non-binary gender non-conforming um, person and allows me to sort of explain that part of my life to someone who would never be exposed to any of those like gender concepts ever. It's like all part of my grand sort of master plan to sort of educate people on what's up <laughs> it drag is activism for everyone it's whether or not people are are actually harnessing it specifically for activism you can't separate the politics from um from gender performance because um gender whether we like it or not is political um it's tied to politics and so in that sense yeah my my drag though is definitely um specifically and intentionally um activistic if that's a word i'm transitioning from working a full-time day job into splitting my time part-time with my day job and part-time doing drag uh, which is exciting and the reason for that particular transition is because well it's for two reasons uh one i 
continue to find that I run out of time and energy to do the most specific and exact work that I would like to do. So uh, transitioning my time to where I can focus a lot more on getting those details right is really important to me. When I tell people that I, I am a working artist and that drag partially supports me, a lot of that is on accident. When I first, seriously, when I first uh, got into drag, I was doing maybe a few amateur competitions for the first like six months to a year. Um, I was getting booked at occasional side things for like 50 bucks a pop uh, and had absolutely no intention to earn a living off of any of it. I was like, I'm too punk for this. I'm too whatever. Like I, my, what I do is too alternative for, to be, to earn money. And, uh, the here I am, you know, two and a half years later after starting and I'm going to be spending four hours a day, um, plus sewing dresses for myself for money. That is absolutely beyond part of the reason I'm transitioning is because I have gotten to this point and looked at my, uh, finances and looked at my bank account was like, Oh my gosh, like I'm actually pulling in, uh, sufficient numbers to be partially supporting myself. If I can make the transition away as someone who's been working in theater and performance for 10 to 12 years, suddenly finally being able to support myself doing that is really wild. So why not make the jump when you can? <laughs> Something that I love about what I do um, and that what a few uh, of a select few other people in this town are doing is something completely different with drag. You know, a, a lot of people will work the nightclub scene and, you know, host a show or two, guest in other people's shows, and that's all there is. And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. The club scene has treated me very kindly. It's where I cut my drag teeth. Uh, but you know, I'm doing work in uh, art galleries and I'm doing work in uh, non-traditional spaces and uh, those kinds of things and exposing drag to those kinds of audiences is something that appeals to me and appeals to a few other people that I really look up to. And together, I think we're really bringing drag into places um, that people wouldn't expect and putting it in front of people that you wouldn't expect either. And I think that's part of what sets me apart from some of my other contemporaries as well as taking the form into other places, pushing its boundaries and exploring the kinds of things that it can say and do. Earlier this year in, I believe it was late April, I found out that I was HIV positive um, through just a routine every three months. Uh, STI screening, um, got on treatment the same week, haven't missed a dose ever since. I announced that I was HIV positive in, I believe it was July or August, somewhere around there. And that was the absolute longest that I could keep it private for my own purposes because I'm the kind of person where I've got to be open about everything. I've got to be honest about everything. I don't like having skeletons in the closet because uh, in part because people when they find things out about you will use them against you sometimes and I like having everything out in the open so that everyone knows who they're dealing with and no one has anything to say about me. Um, I had told a few really really close friends over the course of the months in between when I found out and when I announced it publicly um, so I did have some support in the background which was really nice. Um, and if anyone is uh, struggling with that, that is something that, oh my gosh, saved me more than I realized. Uh, because uh, it's, it, it's one of the most, if not the most isolating experiences I've ever had, because you're dealing with this heavy topic and this huge, 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 huge uh, change to your life. Um, and if you if no one around you knows about it that's it's hard to communicate well i'm uh, emotionally exhausted right now and i can't hang out because of this reason or i would love to come to your show but i feel too sad because of this reason and i was just sick of having to make up excuses like well i'm i'm just having a bad day it's like well it's a little bit more than a bad day but the other part of it too is that 
I, uh, whether I like it or not, and I have liked it in the past and I have not liked it in the past, but I have a public platform um, now that I am at a certain point in my drag. And um, I don't believe it's everyone's responsibility to be this for other people, but I have reached a point in my mental health and my ability to deal with my uh, status that I feel comfortable enough uh, using my microphone literally and figuratively to uh spread knowledge and truth and facts and uh dispel myths about what it is to be a person living with hiv and to be sort of a conduit for resources and um offer people help when I can offer it because um, like I said, it's a very isolating experience. And when you know that someone in your life is going through the same thing you're going through, that alone is a relief in and of itself. And if I can help someone in that way, uh, when I can, that is, that's worth any sort of uh, backlash from any disclosure, public or private. Seattle is a really cool place uh, to get support where you need it. I mean, I'm living on Capitol Hill right now. Thank goodness. I mean, there are, you know, support systems all over the place here. And I'm really fortunate to be living near a lot of those. Um, and I'm fortunate to be part of a queer community that understands those sorts of things. And even if they don't actually understand the nitty gritty of what it's like to live day to day with HIV. Um, the people here are understanding enough to um, have empathy for that and uh, have distance where they need to, but also offer support when it's appropriate, which I think is uh, such an important balance to strike. And I'm very fortunate to know a lot of people who can get that right very easily without having too much explanation. I'll have to like fire off a little bit and set some boundaries a few times. But for the most part, I've been very fortunate. Not everyone is as lucky as uh, I am to have the resources that I've had. So any way in which I can provide access to that is fine in my book.